Good morning to everybody. Um, thank you, as always, for tuning into the presentation. Um, this is the first presentation we've done in a while that is hybrid, that has both sort of people here in the room and, and people attending virtually. So we'll, we'll see how this goes. But I think this is going to be um, an option uh, moving forward. So when people tune in for events, you know, check and see whether it's hybrid or whether it's virtual, because um, we'd love to have people here from the lab in person in the room. Uh, I'm, I'm Mike Albertson. I'm the Deputy Director here at the Center for Global Security Research at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Uh, today we're going to hear from Dr. Uh, Samir Lalwani. Uh, he is the Senior Fellow for Asia Strategy at the Stimson Center and a non-resident fellow with the Seeger Center for Asian Studies at George Washington University. And his CGSR lecture this morning is titled The Threshold Alliance um, Assessing the China-Pakistan Military Relationship. Um, there's a lot of talk at present about, about what's called the two-peer problem, um, which is a problem primarily driven by Chinese uh, nuclear force expansion. Um, this is an emerging challenge for the United States facing two peer nuclear competitors who may be cooperating or coordinating to some degree. Um, this is a problem that's sort of emerging now, but is going to sort of probably persist for the near future. We just held, we just held a workshop here at CGSR a couple of weeks ago looking at U.S.-China-Russia competitive dynamics in a post-2026 world without arms control. Um, but with all of the emerging attention on this triadic relationship, you can't overlook how other countries are going to impact U.S. deterrence and defense calculations, right? North Korea and Iran are going to continue to matter. And of course, you can't overlook that there are other dyadic and triadic military relationships taking place out there that are going to drive the deterrence and defense calculations of Russia, and of China, and thus the United States. And India-Pakistan, India-China dyads are good examples of longstanding but complex interactions that U.S. policymakers have had to pay some degree of attention towards. But the India-Pakistan-China triadic relationship is another one worthy of further study. And I think we're, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Lawani with us today to look at one of these relationships, the, the China-Pakistan relationship, which will be useful not only on its own merits, but also implications for South Asia, implications for how we think about Russia-China relationship in the two-peer environment. I think there's often this, this trap where you see the complex security environment and you want to look at the whole constellation at once. And, and really the, the way to go about it is to sort of pick the different dyads and look at them very closely. And then you, looking at those dyads, you can then expand into triads. You can then expand to sort of look at the whole constellation. But if you don't get the dyads right, it's very difficult to sort of look at look at the whole, and so it's great that we have a speaker here to look at one of those pieces to perhaps you know draw out some implications for other things. Um, as I said, Dr. Lawani is a senior fellow at the Simpson Center. He researches deterrence, interstate rivalry, alliances, crisis behavior, and counterinsurgency. He's also a term member of the Council of Foreign Relations, uh, a contributor to War on the Rocks, um, which is a very is a very popular um, publication for a lot of these kind of discussions. Uh, he's been an adjunct professor at George Washington and a Stanton uh, nuclear security postdoc at RAND. Um, he's the author of Investigating Crises, South Asia's Lessons, Evolving Dynamics and Trajectories, came out from the Stimson Center. Um, he completed his PhD from MIT's Department of Political Science, where he was in affiliate with the Security Studies Program, uh, which is a fantastic program and sends a lot of very smart people from academia into the policy community. Uh, the ground rules, uh, Dr. Lawan is going to talk for about 30 to 45 minutes, at which point we'll open the floor up for discussion. We have people here in the room um, who can actually raise their real hands uh, for Samir to call on. Um, if you're tuning in virtually, I'm going to step aside from the podium and go sort of monitor the online chat, so please get your hands up electronically. Uh, please submit your questions in the chat function so we can get the discussion rolling quickly. Um, once his remarks conclude, and get as many of your comments in as, as we can. So, Samir, thank you again for taking the time to be with us, and, and over to you for the talk. Um, thank you, Mike, uh, for, for that introduction. I'm really excited to be back in the Bay Area. Um, uh, I grew up in the Bay Area, been a fan of Golden State Warriors since the run TMC days, so it's a good time to be back. Uh, I'm excited to present this project I have been working on for about six months or so. I've been thinking about it for a few years, and um, it's the first time I'm presenting it, so please bear with me. Um, and it's actually, I, I really like the way Mike described it, it's like sort of di dialing in on a particular dyad to also then start to think about the broader constellation. So I'm hoping I can get feedback from you all because it's still a work in progress um, on how this might be able to be situated in the wider constellation of integrated deterrence, Indo-Pacific competition, things like that. 
All right, so the title is Threshold Alliance, China Military, China Pakistan Military Relationship. Um, and basically, it starts with this premise. Uh, it was a great article by Patty Kim in Foreign Affairs last year. It was talking about China's search for allies um, and specifically uh, talking a lot about the Russia relationship, but also Pakistan as well. Um, but there's been a lot of dismissiveness of China's search for allies. Um, there's a recent quote by a, a, a senator um, who was talking about China not having any allies or partners, but really just vassals. Uh, and I wanted to query that a little bit to understand what, you know, what, what, is the, what are the nature of these relationships. Uh, Pakistan's a particularly unlikely partner in some ways, right? It's, it's been a U.S. ally and still nominally is uh, a U.S. ally uh, or a major non-NATO ally. Uh, it's in a secondary region that's sort of outside the immediate scope of China's main security dilemmas. Uh, and it's not even a hegemon in the region. And nevertheless, this relationship has been fairly robust for over 60 years. Um, so I think it warrants some empirical scrutiny. Uh, so there was this concept that we talked about a lot in the 80s and maybe even today uh, about a threshold state when it comes to, to nuclear weapons. And actually, Pakistan was referred to as a threshold state uh, because it had the material and technical conditions to quickly transform into a nuclear-capable power uh, and sometimes referred to as sort of a turnkey uh, state or thur turnkey capability. Uh, and I thought this concept is useful for thinking about the relationship with China. Um, so China may not have a formal alliance in sort of a declared mutual defense pact with any country, uh, except North Korea is sort of an exception, but it might be building a lot of the components of, uh, of an alliance in different, in disparate parts that maybe go a little bit under the radar and uh, lead to policymakers underappreciating or um, discounting uh, what China might be building. So I'm going to talk to you about sort of three components of this relationship, the arms transfers, uh, the military interactions, we're only talking about like exercises and um, staff meetings, and then um, prospects for basing access and power projection, and then conclude with a few thoughts on what, what the implications might be. So, I'll, but I'll start off with sort of the, the, the big sort of punchlines up front and that maybe will help frame the discussion a little bit. I think, you know, on each of these, Pakistan's combat-capable hardware is heavily dependent on China, and it'll grow more so uh, by 2030. And this is sort of, this implicates Pakistan's force structure. Um, it, on its military interoperability with China, I think the pace, scale, and complexity of China-Pakistan military ex exercises suggest a more advanced prospects for interoperability. Uh, I'm going to make the contention that I think Pakistan might be China's most important military partner, even more so than Russia. But I understand that's a debatable and maybe controversial proposition. So welcome feedback on and discussion of that. Uh, the, on, when it comes to access and power projection, I think what we're seeing is that the material conditions for PLAN, uh, PLA Navy basing are developing. And there are some significant political obstacles, but I think they're declining, and I'll go into why I think that might be the case. So the broad implication, then, is that Pakistan and China might be approaching the material qualities of an alliance, even if they've not yet made the political commitments for it. Pakistan may be a few turnkeys away from a functional alliance as a partner for burden sharing, network security missions, access, and power projection. So there's some bold claims. I'm going to try to substantiate that um, in this presentation. So let's talk look first about arms transfers. Um, and, you know, I started writing to myself, like, China provides, and then a list of things. And I realized that China provides is, like, maybe an apt phrase for the relationship writ large. There's a lot of stuff that China has done for Pakistan um, over decades. Uh, but I think, uh, as you'll see in, this, uh, in, in a couple slides ahead, um, I think there's been sort of a, um, an exponential growth in the last 10 years. So there's, the, in terms of total cumulative equipment and um, provided to Pakistan, it has been the lead supplier uh, over time. And in the, in the, next, in the last 10 years, it's pretty, it has a pretty substantial jump. And in the next 10 years, I think it'll be um, the undisputed military partner of Pakistan, far ahead of, of what the United States has been doing with Pakistan. Um, the plurality, at least today, of Pakistan's force structure comes from China. But when you drill down into combat and strike capabilities, it is overwhelmingly dependent on Chinese platform systems, munitions, et cetera. Um, I think while probably we, what may be best known in, in this room in particular uh, are the strategic capabilities that uh, China has provided Pakistan over uh, several decades. But there are a lot of support ca supporting capabilities that enable Pakistan's strategic uh, capacity. And we'll, we'll get into them a little bit, but there are a lot to do with communications, ISR, um, satellite communication links. And I think those 
while they're, they're harder to study, are maybe as important as sort of the missile developments and the, uh, uh, the nuclear fuel cycle sort of transfers that took place in the 80s. Uh, and then, you know, what should also not be discounted is the, the level of co-production that uh, China is willing to do with Pakistan, which it, it's hard to estimate this, again, because you're just sort of, this is all based on open source analysis. Um, but it seems to put to shame sort of the things that, like, the U.S. and India have been talking about in terms of co-production, because China is so far, China and Pakistan are so far ahead in terms of building uh, actual platforms in Pakistan that are then being exported to third parties. Uh, and so... There's a debate over you know, how much technology transfer or how much absorption is actually taking place. But nevertheless, there are, there's a political economy element to this relationship as much as just raw um, military power. So this is a, I'm going to show you a slide about, so that, that de demonstrates that in the last 50 years, China has been the largest provider of total conventional arms to Pakistan. This is measured uh, in, with ZIPRI data, which is like a sort of, they have this trade indicator value, which is not to be taken as a literal dollar figure, but as a relative measure of uh, the value of arms transfers. This is a cumulative measure of what they provide. And you can see this like noticeable spike around 2008. Uh, where the U.S. starts to flatline, the U.S. is the blue line, um, U.S. arms transfers to Pakistan, measured both in terms of sales but also in terms of things like uh, excess uh, defense articles, uh, it really starts to plateau um, around 2010, but, Pox, uh, but China really spikes. That's not a terribly surprising finding, but I think that the scale of it, the, the magnitude is what's maybe pretty surprising. In the last 10 years, China has provided uh, the value equivalent to all the, everything that the United States has provided uh, in the last 60 years, or um, the last 70 years. So it's a pretty significant uh, spike. This is a, a measure of China's, um, of, of the different services force structures that are that originate from China. So what we did is we took all the major platforms of every Pakistan military service and coded them by country origin. And what we find is that, uh, I'm showing you only sort of what comes from China, but what we find is that you know, the Air Force is you know, somewhere about 42% uh, originating from China. Uh, the, the Army, it's about sort of closer to 30%, and, and the Navy is about 20%. But all these, what we did was we also looked at um, uh, what's projected to be cycled out of Pakistan's arsenal over the next 10 years. Things are going obsolete and going to be retired, and new platforms that are coming online. So, like, for example, uh, Pakistan's likely to... Uh, um, to retire its Mirage fighters, its uh, sort of third generation Mirage fighters, and likely to increase the number of J-10s that it, it, it purchases from China or, or gets, uh, receives from China. So you'll start to see a spike, sort of a growth in its um, Air Force capabilities coming from, uh, from China. Similarly, uh, the Army is you know, onlining VT-4 tanks um, and uh, cycling out some of the older platforms that, you know, uh, from, from the UK and the United States. And the Navy, I think, sort of this is maybe the, the most stark, where they're bringing in new SSKs, um, uh, new, uh, new frigates, uh, and, um, and cycling out some of the older platforms that they've had that come from sort of France, the UK, the United States. So essentially, the, the basic story is that in its force structure, the Western sources of uh, capabilities are declining, and China is, is replacing them as, as Pakistan modernizes. And it's even more profound when you look at China, uh, Pakistan's higher-end combat strike platforms. It's sort of most advanced generation capabilities, but also the ones that are specifically tasked with shooting and killing things, so that's sort of the kinetic stuff, as opposed to the transport, uh, ISR, um, logistics end of, of things. And these are, you know, modern attack aircraft, armor and artillery, combatant ship missile cells, and diesel electric attack submarines. Uh, so I think, let's see if I can find this. Um, this might be a useful graph, right? So what we did is we took sort of a few features of each of the services. I keep saying we, but this is me. Uh, I had a research assistant who helped me a great deal with this, uh, Nora Davis, but this is, uh, you know, don't want to no one else should get the blame for this except me. Um, but we looked at sort of tanks, fires like uh, rocket, uh, uh, rocket launchers and um, other types of indirect fires, uh, legacy attack and modern attack platforms, and then measured the Navy um, uh, capabilities in terms of displacement, combat ship displacement, as well as ship missile cells. And you see that 
China is sort of the, is the dominant source for all of these strike and combat capabilities for Pakistan. The U.S. is, you know, far less. Um, there is a, a, um, a growing source that's not listed on this, which is from Turkey, and that might be sort of another pivotal player in, in Pakistan's um, sourcing of, of, of new capabilities. But for the most part, it's, it's, it's really heavily dependent on China. The strategic capabilities, maybe people are familiar in this room with. Um, so I don't, I'm not going to go through this. And, and the paper that I'm working on is not really spending a whole lot of time on this, because this is actually probably the most studied element of the China-Pakistan relationship is the nuclear capability transfers, the missile transfers, the M11s that took place in the 1990s. But there are some new things that are taking place. There's an anti-ship ballistic missile program that Pakistan is basically, it, the, 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 again, reports are spotty, but it looks like they're trying to derive from the DF-21 uh, Chinese ASBM. Um, so if you think about right now, in the US DOD's um, uh, China military power report uh, estimates that China's strike capabilities from its mainland can already reach parts of the Indian Ocean. But if you were to imagine that it had a partner who has ASBM capabilities projecting from uh, the coastline of the Indian Ocean, uh, its, its reach could be even greater if there was some, some degree of integration. Uh, Pakistan seems to be integrating a lot of its air defenses and syncing them up with Chinese systems. So there's a lot of, uh, they had a patchwork of different systems from um, uh, Italy, I think maybe Sweden uh, and elsewhere, but the, the, they're all gradually becoming Chinese. They're sort of phasing out older systems and bringing in new Chinese systems, most recently the HQ-9P uh, for medium and high altitude air defenses. The electronic warfare systems are also being sourced from China, so anything sort of competing in the electromagnetic spectrum is going to depend on China. Uh, navigation satellites. Uh, Pakistan was, is reported to have been the first country, maybe the only country, that has military access to, to the Beidou satellite uh, navigation network, um, and ostensibly has been planning on this uh, for a lot of guidance for its new missiles, like the FATA um, guided uh, rocket launcher. So um, they're depending a lot on the sort of the guidance, navigation, uh, and ISR capabilities of China for uh, their own uh, for, for the for the back end of their their strike systems as much as they are sort of the, the pointy end of of the spear, and then the part that I think really is another project that I'd like to take up in the future, but is worth sort of thinking about is like this whole tech stack uh, that China has provided Pakistan probably has a lot of path dependencies and integration that I don't fully appreciate and understand, but it's just worth sort of like taking stock of all of it, right? The fiber optic cable that runs from Xinjiang province through Pakistan is going to be the source for China's undersea cable network that they'll be projecting to Africa and to Europe and other parts uh, of the Indian Ocean. Uh, so it's, its undersea cable network is going to be heavily dependent on, on Pakistan. There's sort of an interdependence here. Uh, and then that is going to be linked up with uh, Huawei 5G wireless communications that Pakistan uh, is, is sourcing heavily. Uh, these are tethered to cloud computing centers and data processing centers um, that are going to be located in Pakistan. Uh, and then you can sort of imagine a whole sort of software industry that might be dependent on this as well. And this could be commercial, but it could have strategic latency uh, potential um, as well. So, so that's like a lot of stuff happening beneath the surface that I, I confess I don't fully understand, but I think it, it is worthy of study because I think there are a lot of strategic effects of these, um, what sometimes see like commercial uh, activity. The last point I'll just add is that, you know, there is a political economy story here, which is that China has really helped Pakistan build things um, and export them and sort of make some money, at least capture some of the value in the value chain of uh, military modernization. So, I mean, uh, over a decade or two decades ago, they helped them build a, a Pakistan aeronautical complex at, complex at Kamra. Uh, they've been building JF-17s here. Uh, there's debates as to whether there's a lot of technology transfer and knowledge sort of economy in Pakistan or whether it's uh, just sort of knockdown kits that they're assembling there. But there is some argument that there's at least some, some, some elements of indigenization that are taking place. That, you know, radar systems are being built in Pakistan and developed in Pakistan. The K-8 trainers are also being built there. And ultimately, I mean, Pakistan has ambitions to turn this into an aviation city that's sort of as much a knowledge economy as, as a production center. Um, and it seems like it's being abetted by, by uh, China support, and they're exporting to countries like Nigeria, Myanmar, uh, and elsewhere. So, so there's there's a lot going on there that I think is not appreciated. And the reason I think is relevant is because I think the United States is in in a 
in a process of trying to convince its partners and allies to be um, an importer or sort of a, a, a partner in certain combat platforms, but is far less willing to share the, the, the distribution of production and to sort of support industrial production, even in Five Eyes countries. And this is a, this is a, a critical um, sore point with Australia, for example, about sort of munitions production, guided munitions production in Australia, and the restrictions the U.S. has when it comes to export control laws, disclosure laws, and buy American clauses um, have really impeded that, and it looks like China um, it has managed to find a way to at least do this with Pakistan and potentially could be a, a template for others as well in the future. So that's, that's sort of the, the wrap on the arms transfer side of things. Let me talk to you a little bit about the military interactions between the Chinese and Pakistani militaries. I mean, in short, I think they're increasing. I mean, you, could, you could argue here that China's military partnership with Pakistan is, surpasses that of all of China's other military relationships. Uh, and it's measured in terms of Chinese military diplomacy with Pakistan, in terms of exercises, port call, senior military engagements. Quantitatively, I think it's it's pretty clear that it exceeds the engagements of all other countries, including with Russia. Uh, but you also see increasing quality and complexity of the kinds of exercises that they're doing together, and increasing formalization of staff dialogues that are fairly high level. So I'll go through each of these real quick. Um, the National Defense University did a really good job of putting together this data set of Chinese military diplomacy, where they measure these three things uh, in the open source exercises, port calls, senior activity. And they did it for China's interactions with all countries from 2003 to 2018. So I took that data set uh, and then added for the last three years to see you know, where, what was going on with the Pakistan-China relationship and also what was going on with the Russia relationship. And I'll, I'll you know, be upfront that I'm not sure my Russia data is totally accurate. It could be a little bit higher. But nevertheless, it's a useful um, heuristic device to show the comparison. I think we've talked a lot about the China-Russia relationship in the last six months and you know, even uh, beyond that, but there's been very little discussion of the degree of China-Pakistan military cooperation, even though it looks to me like it's exceeded the Russia relationship, both in senior activity as well as in sort of the volume of exercises. And China and Pakistan have a set of named exercises that are now regular recurring exercises in the naval, air force, uh, army, and maybe even special forces or a CT domain as well. So they might have four distinct lines of annual or semi-annual exercises. I think this really picked up after 2011. That seems to be what, what I've gleaned from, from the literature. Um, coincidence is whether, you know, the, 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 the sort of the nadir of the U.S.-Pakistan relationship coinciding with sort of this new uh, robust relationship with China, might, that might be, the timing might line up on that, but um, that's just speculation right now. So pretty significant amounts of uh, Quant, you know, the frequency of cooperation or uh, frequency of military interactions. Uh, but the quality is something that I think we should think about as well because uh, when you drill into some of these particular exercises, you can see that there's growing complexity in, in what they're actually doing, the, the, the content of the exercise itself. So this came to me because I was reading a description of a China Russia military exercise. And two Russia experts are basically saying these exercises, this is the China-Russia exercise regimen, these exercises are typically conducted in parallel rather than jointly and do not involve tactical or operational coordination to improve the country's interoperability or joint warfighting skills. The limited scale and scope of these exercises suggest that their utility beyond geopolitical posturing is limited at best. This is uh, Eugene Romer and another scholar from the Carnegie Endowment uh, writing about the, the China-Russia China regimen. And that really contrasts with what I was starting to read about uh, the Shaheen exercise, which is the annual Air Force exercise between China and Pakistan. So I read some literature on how you evaluate the complexity of exercises. There's a really good RAND report by um, uh, Bonnie Lin and Christina Garofalo on um, uh, PLA air defense exercises, but it provides sort of a useful template for how to evaluate complexity. You think about opposition forces, live fire, nighttime training, electromagnetic countermeasures that are sort of all integrated into an exercise, complex physical environments, unscripted or unknown features, combined arms with other supporting aircraft like ISR, electronic warfare, or ground communications, joint training with another service, and uh, large air battles that are greater than one-on-one -on -one air battles. So these are 10 measures of complexity. Uh, it's a very crude way to measure this, but nevertheless, what I did was I went through each of the public descriptions of the Shaheen exercises from multiple sources and tried to code each exercise dating back to 2011, how many of these features they included. 
uh, again, that were sort of publicly named. So obviously there's, it's possible that there wasn't disclosure of this, but there seems to be an incentive for both sides to brag about what they're actually doing. And so this is uh, the plot that I came up with um, for what the complexity looks like. And basically after 2016, it looks like these are getting much more complex uh, than sort of the earlier period. 2016 is kind of a missing data point because it's really thin description as to what was going on during that time. I have my suspicions as to why there's not a lot of data on or not a lot of dis description of that. But nevertheless, I think what we've seen in the last few years is sort of a, a pretty significant bump in um, how complex these Shaheen exercises uh, actually are. We can, we can unpack that um, in, in Q&A if people want to sort of query that a little bit further. But let me read to you a description of the 2019 Shaheen exercise. This is by Senior Colonel uh, Du Wen Long. So it's coming from the, um, the PLA side. And it describes the uh, Shaheen 8 exercises. The biggest feature of the joint training this time is that it's conducted in a back-to-back -back manner whereby neither party is informed of the other situation and has to find it completely depending on the early warning aircraft, predict its operations, and immediately change the training plan. The training is more confrontational than previous ones that followed prearranged plans. Besides, all the confrontational exercises are carried out in highly complicated environments, simulating plateaus or mountainous areas, so the troops have to overcome the impacts caused by natural conditions and disturbing factors. Since it's back-to-back -back without the communication of any information, the Shaheen Eagle 8X joint training features a keener sense of unfamiliarity and is very close to real combat environment, with its indicators and plans all reaching the real combat level. Again, it's all nominal, it's all claimed, but I still think that there is something there that is much more robust than what we're seeing in the China-Russia uh, military exercises. Similarly, in the last, uh, there's been some naval exercises between China and Pakistan uh, over the past decade plus, but it, it got elevated to a named exercise called Sea Guardian, uh, and they did one in 2020, and uh, just did one actually a few weeks ago in July in 2022, um, off the coast of Shanghai. So let me read you a, 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 I wrote up sort of a quick description of this too, because it sort of tells you a little bit about the robustness of the naval exercise. It was held off the coast of Shanghai, including joint communications, live fire, missile and main gun attacks against maritime targets, anti-aircraft shooting with close in weapon systems, replenishments, tactical maneuvering, anti-submarine warfare, air defense and anti-missile, as well as joint support on damaged vessels. While the Pakistan Navy only brought a guided missile frigate, which had been produced in China and was then being handed off to the Pakistan Navy. The PLA Navy assets included guided missile frigates, corvettes, a comprehensive supply ship, an early warning aircraft, two fighter jets, and a helicopter. During the exercise, the Pakistan Navy got the opportunity to, quote unquote, to integrate into the PLA's combat system and receive real-time battlefield information, while a PLA Navy's early warning aircraft provided situational intelligence and targeting data to the Pakistani vessel in the missile attack drill. I mean, this seems to me like an enmeshment of, um, uh, of not only of combat systems, but of a kill chain. And that, that seemed pretty significant. So uh, I welcome sort of others to tell me that this is sort of a pretty routine exercise in the Navy, but from what I've looked at from the US India Navy exercises, that is something that I think the US Navy would salivate at if they had the opportunity to do something of that, that um, robust uh, nature. So um, it, it tells me that there's something that it seems that this is much deeper than um, maybe otherwise appreciated. Also, it's worth discussing, or it's worth considering that since 2016, a lot of the public descriptions of these exercises have really emphasized the term interoperability. Possible that this is just a throwaway line because it's trying to emulate some of the language that the US uses about its partners and allies, or it's possible that they're actually preparing for um, combined military operations, which would sort of warrant interoperability. There's another theory that's worth thinking about as to what, why, why is China motivated to do this? And I heard this specifically discussed with the air exercises, that you know, China hasn't fought, actually fought a war since 1979. Pakistan's been fighting, um, you know, admittedly mostly counterterrorism operations, but combined arms operations uh, for the last 20 years. They had a recent uh, um, operation in, in sort of a live sort of operation against the Indian military in 2019. And the Chinese, while they have a lot of advanced weapon systems, may not have upgraded their tactics and operational concepts to adapt to the, the technical systems. And so what they might be doing is trying to actually learn from the Pakistani pilots um, how to operate in this environment, how to think about 
uh, how tactics and operations sort of integrate with uh, a broader strategy. It's a, it's a hypothesis I think that's worth thinking about, but it's interesting because you would assume this is an asymmetric one directional relationship with only Pakistan is getting benefits and it's possible that China is also learning a lot from um, this level of close uh, cooperation and exercise regimen. The last part of this that I don't have a whole lot of data about, but it's, it's salient nevertheless to mention is that there's a level of formalization that's starting to take place. So in June of this year, the Pakistan Army Chief um, General Bajwa uh, traveled to China with a delegation to meet with the vice chair of the CMC, uh, and I won't even try to pronounce his name, it's just not my forte. Uh, but I've been told by other China scholars that you know meeting the vice chair of the CMC and having sort of a day-long session or multi-day-long session with him and his staff is something that doesn't even happen for U.S. government officials. It's pretty significant uh, and a high-level meeting, and this was sort of publicly described as the Pakistan-China Joint Military Cooperation Committee, under which there is a sort of a Joint Cooperation Military Affairs subcommittee, as well as a Military Equipment and Training subcommittee, uh, which, while it was publicly announced uh, this year, I think uh, it's possible it's been around for a, a couple years. So it just suggests like another level of formalization, like the way we, you know, elevate um, relationships with countries in sort of a, a, a sort of a, a trilateral annual meeting or a, a bilateral annual meeting um, that has sort of a formal name and sort of an exercise attached to it. Uh, that level of formalization means that there's a lot of staff work that builds into that, right? There's a lot of people who are working on this if it becomes sort of a regular and routinized process. It's institutionalized, uh, and that suggests, you know, some robustness and some heft to it, some resources behind it. So the last part I want to talk to you about is this third dimension of the relationship of power projection uh, and potentially military basing. And a lot of attention has, has focused in particularly on the Gwadar naval facility. So there seems to be at least some interest in Pakistan for China to develop power projection capabilities at Gwadar and some belief within the PLA that China can utilize basing options if it so chooses in the future. So there are experts who have identified significant material developments for likely military use but they remain somewhat skeptical that the material and political obstacles, including Pakistani public opinion, uh, could obstruct you know, converting this naval facility access point into a wartime military base. Um, but I, I would argue that these seem to be actually more surmountable obstacles than maybe sort of at first blush. And it would be, it's something that I think is, is, is rapidly changing. So the, uh, there's a really great report by a, a group of scholars at the Naval War College on Gwadar, um, and uh, the lead author is Isaac Cardin, who's been doing a lot of work on how China thinks about power projection, uh, making use of ports and facilities. There's a great IS article that came out um, this year on it. Uh, and so they're, they're sort of one of their top line conclusions on Gwadar is that Gwadar is not a PLA base, but their facilities, parts, and technicians may be readily employed for some of the, plant, uh, the PLAN fleet. Waters port facilities could support PLAN's largest vessels. Uh, and so essentially they kind of come to this sort of middle ground that it's like it can be a naval facility, um, maybe sort of along the lines of, of Djibouti or sort of how Djibouti was initially envisioned, but may not be resilient enough for actual wartime operations, uh, that there'll be, you know, significant changes that would be really required to, to do that. And I think that's actually... Um, even if it's not a base, I think it, it clearly can still be employed for China's power projection. And this question of whether it's survivable or defensible in wartime is one that I think we were asking about the, the island features in the South China Sea um, only you know, eight, eight years ago. Right? So it ostensibly does not look defensible, it doesn't look hardened, uh, but you can rapidly upgrade it. You can pour a lot of concrete, you can put a lot of air defense systems pretty rapidly, and suddenly what seems like a very vulnerable spot that looks like for, for political symbol, symbolic purposes suddenly can actually be, have some military utility, right? And it still requires an adversary has to, an adversary or the United States uh, would have to plan for it, and it would change pretty dramatically the geography and geometry of any conflict with China. So I think that's a, it's, I think it's a variable condition that actually might, be, might have more variance than, than we, um, think about, that's on the material obstacle side of things. I mean, no, no country is more capable of pouring concrete in such rapid, um, at a rapid pace in such large numbers as, as China. So I think that suggests that we should at least consider the possibility of how it could be upgraded. Certainly the PLA officials seem to assume that they, um, this is a turnkey facility. Uh, so actually in the report, there's, um, well, 
in, the, in another article by another analyst, they described that the PLA Navy foothold is just a matter of time, and it largely has to do with the force structure that Pakistan is bringing into its country. So the frigates and the SSK submarines uh, that Pakistan is buying from China, building from China, the operations of them, the maintenance and sustainment will really depend on PLAN support staff being present um, at, at uh, naval bases. So there's already going to be, and may already be, a, a PLA and footprint um, at Pakistani naval bases. Uh, but even this report, there's a, a quote from one um, Chinese uh, 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 military officer who says that the food is already on the plate, we'll eat it whenever we want to, suggesting that they at least believe that they have the opportunity to scale up um, at, at the moment of their choosing. And I think the obstacles, I sort of talked about the material obstacles a little bit, but you know, these hardened facilities, bunkers, coastal and air defense, uh, coastal and air defenses, specialized parts, ordnance and equipment, and defense personnel, I think they all, uh, while it's right to point out that they're not, they may not be, there's not public evidence of them being present yet, they, I think they all could be scaled. But it's actually the political obstacles that the authors of the report say are the most significant um, reason why this is not a military base. And there's two arguments they make. So one is that, um, this, if China was to turn this into a military base, it would fundamentally alienate India and change China's entire South Asia strategy. Uh, and two, that Pakistan, it's not clear that Pakistan is like willing to countenance uh, a major Chinese military put, footprint used for power projection uh, in the region. So I, I would challenge both of these. So the first one, the, the alienation of India, I think when this report was written in August of 2020, that alienation had just started, but it was really getting much more profound, right? Essentially, China made a choice to um, contest borders that had been fairly stable, or you know, not, I shouldn't say stable, but contest sort of an, a status quo understanding of the China-Pakistan, a China-India um, border dispute, and moved troops in, it became a big crisis. It's still an ongoing crisis from the, the Indian military and the Indian government's perspective. Uh, public opinion is really mobilized against China. It still continues to this day. Uh, so I think that shift has already sailed. If that, was an, uh, if that was an obstacle in Chinese strategists' minds that they don't want to disrupt their relationship with India, it's already happened. The second one is about sort of what, what Pakistani attitudes are towards having China um, essentially set up shop and, and base out of their territory. And here it's actually, um, this is where sort of I, I make, I think, a new contribution. And in order to, I started going through Chinese, uh, uh, Pakistani strategic journals to understand how the military thought about China and its presence in the region. And so there's a lot of different writings about how they think about Gwadar and China. Uh, so they essentially, I'd, I'd say that they welcome uh, a number of roles that China could play um, in, on its coastline and in, on Pakistani territory. First, uh, Gwadar being providing an alternative shipping route for China. This, I think, is the most conventional understanding of how we think about CPEC and Gwadar, at least initially, that Pakistan would give uh, a naval base to China at Gwadar port to... Um, uh, to minimize the cost of transport of transportation of oil to China. These are all, by the way, journals that are published by the Pakistan military or general headquarters. Uh, and so these are coming from either uh, retired officers or serving officers in some cases. Uh, there's another sort of explanation as to what the utility of Gwadar is that it could sustain PLAN operations in the Indian Ocean. So this is about keeping Chinese ships on station in the Indian Ocean for extended periods of time. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Asim in Citadel, which is the Command and Staff College journal, writes that the potential for Gwadar to be used in support of future Chinese naval operations is also very real. And in the Margala papers, I can't remember the, the first name of the author, but Mirza writes that China could also use Gwadar to monitor her slocks originating from the Persian Gulf. There is also belief that this could constrain Indian and American navies, that Chinese presence specifically could have a positive effect on Pakistan security, but also on, uh, could be an advantage for China. Naval facilities or foothold in the Arabian Sea coast could provide Chinese a forward base to monitor U.S. naval activity in the Persian Gulf region and Indian naval activity in the Arabian Sea. Chinese presence in Gwadar would be strong, a strong impediment for India in the realization of its hegemony in the Indian Ocean region. So, Essentially, I think Pakistan at times talks about China like as a form of extended deterrence. Uh, and I'm, I'm, these are individuals, but these are individuals writing in military and state-sanctioned publications uh, that are, you know, fairly, um, that are sort of fairly internal dialogues within the Pakistan military. This suggests to me that there, the hesitations that I think we impute, impute to, to Pakistan may not actually be um, as robust as we think. And then finally, there's a, an argument to be made that um, Chinese presence or PLA and presence would counteract and deter future blockades of uh, not only of Pakistan, but for, uh, blockades targeted at China. So CPEC would also fulfill 
China's strategy to generate its effects in the Indian Ocean and expand its influence, thus countering any future blockade to its energy routes. There's even some discussion in other literature that uh, giving PLAN access to water or other coastal um, ports could allow the Chinese to implement a counter blockade in the Strait of Hormuz to essentially um, sort of provide counter pressure, sort of a horizontal escalation in the event of a Strait of Malacca blockade. So I think the Pakistan, Pakistani leadership and, and strategists are thinking actively about how um, China could make most use of presence there and how Pakistan could take advantage of that opportunity. I don't think that this is all to say that I think the uh, the, bar the political sort of barriers that we think are robust and that certainly the authors of that report um, maybe uh, accurately identified as really robust actually are starting to diminish over time and ones that we should be paying close attention to. All right, so let me just conclude with some what I think are some implications. Uh, we have a lot of discussion these days in, in sort of U.S. strategic circles about the Pacific being sort of this primary theater, but I think the Indian Ocean um, region balance of power is really shifting dramatically, uh, and it shouldn't be the primary focus. Obviously, the Pacific has primacy for a number of reasons, but I think we need to, we ought to be paying attention not just to the, the near-term to five-year window of what happens um, in the Pacific and Taiwan, but also over the next 10 years and what the PLAN will be able to do in the Indian Ocean over the next 10 years, in part because it's not simply the PLAN um, expanding and rising and projecting power, but it's also the assumptions about the, the bulwark of resistance against that, uh, I think, actually being far more diminished. And a lot of that has to do with sort of the weakness of the Indian Navy and um, Indian counter-Navy capabilities. The second implication, I think, is that... Uh, uh, Prepositioning and interoperability that seems to be taking place pretty actively between China and Pakistan really seems to lower the cost and the conspicuousness of upgrading from a naval facility or sort of a presence to a resilient and possibly uh, 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 power projection capable base. Um, I think this this seems to me akin to some of the latency arguments, right? It's like you're you're, you're prepositioning a lot of capabilities. Uh, similar platforms, sustainment lines, presence, and the ability to operate and rely on each other's battle networks. Um, and so the, the cost of flipping a switch to turn that up, I think, is a lot lower than we think. Uh, I also think uh, I like the money ball analogy, uh, not just because I'm from the Bay Area, but because I think we, for a long time, U.S. policymakers have talked about alliances uh, as sort of this grandiose bargain and commitment that's much more political. And I think if we think about it, if we break it up into functions and think about alliances as a set of functions about burden sharing, about access, about aggregation, about data, uh, and about you know, um, a number of other functions that we think we derive from, uh, from about political economy relations, uh, you can start to see that a lot of those functions are being performed by this relationship, even if we don't call it a formal alliance. Uh, and that means, I think, that the American alliance system may not be as unique an advantage as we think it to be. Uh, this is something that I think is sort of a very common talking point in, in the Pentagon, uh, both in publications and statements, that we have sort of this unique and coveted asset of our allies and partners and that network of partners. I think, it, I think that is correct in that we have a lot of that, but others are catching up. And I think China might be starting to build some of this as well, and we should be attentive to how they're building it, which might look a little different, similar to the way that their power projection might look different from our form of power projection. Uh, and I think there's a sort of point for academics to think about, which is that external balancing can be led through internal balancing rather than formal commitments. Uh, you can cu cultivate a dependence from the bottom up. Um, and so I think the last thing I want to think about more going forward is whether we think these threshold alliances are reversible. I think the interesting condition of, back to the sort of the nuclear discussion of like a threshold state, so once you sort of approach this technical material capacity, it's not like you could really forget it. It's not like, I mean, I guess you could sort of destroy your entire scientific community, but it's really hard to sort of expunge all that knowledge and that capacity. Uh, but threshold alliances might be reversible over time, essentially if you change out and substitute out different things, right? If you, uh, so I don't think Pakistan has quite crossed a point of no return. I think we might be approaching that, uh, but I think it's possible that, you know, if Pakistan decides it wants to do something different, it might be able to reverse course. Um, but that's, that's, you know, Again, um, a hypothesis, not a, not a um, guarantee. So with that, I, I'd love to uh, turn it over to, to questions and discussion uh, and feedback and, and any other uh, ideas. But thank you for, for your indulgence. Appreciate it.